Thank you, Claudia, for that really nice introduction. Um, and really to you and to everyone who was involved in arranging my trip here. Is that, can you hear? Um, and I should introduce my husband and co-author of the book, Tom Wolfe, who is over here. And um, I may turn to him to help me answer questions, depending on whether they're outside my um, field of expertise. So it's a great pleasure for me to be here at Drake, um, the alma mater of Susan Glassville, class of 1899. I've spent the day on campus visiting classes, touring the law school, um, the university library, walking around the grounds, and of course I've imagined Susan Glassville here um, as a young woman in her early 20s, more than 20 years ago, more than 100 years ago. Glaspell always remembered her time here at Drake with great fondness and great happiness. Um, and Drake, Drake University surely must be very proud to call Susan Glaspell one of its own. Um, Susan Glaspell is one of the preeminent American writers of the 20th century, and I have no doubt that her time here at Drake helped to shape her into the exceptional author and woman that she became. At Drake, she benefited from the great teaching, the encouragement from her professors. Um, she absorbed the diversity and progressive ideas that were institutional goals of Drake, um, and she made lifelong friends here. The opportunity surely made her a better writer, but even more significantly, I think that her time at Drake gave her the confidence and the ambition, and both of those were unusual in a woman of her time, to allow herself to devote herself to a career that she loved, and that was writing. Susan Glaspell was remarkably successful during her lifetime, and she was very unique in publishing in three different literary genres. She produced nine novels, and several at the time were on the New York Times best-selling list, um, vying with Hemingway and Faulkner. She wrote 14 plays, considered groundbreaking, really, which were produced on Broadway and very well reviewed. And um, one of them won the Pulitzer Prize in 1931. With her husband, Jig Cook, she started the Provincetown Players, which was one of the best little theaters in America. Um, the Provincetown Players produced her plays and gave Eugene O'Neill his start. Glaspell also wrote more than 50 short stories, um, and I have a special interest in her short stories. They were published in the best literary and most popular magazines, um, and sometimes, as was the case with Jury of Her Peers, which is a topic of my talk today, they reached more than one million readers, which was remarkable for that time. Now, Susan Glaspell's stories are wonderful. They range from the realistic and the dramatic narrative as illustrated by a jury of her peers, um, but they also are often social satire and comedy. Um, Glaspell sp spent much of her time in the East, but she never abandoned her roots uh, in the Midwest. And many of her plays and short stories and novels are set in small rural towns in Iowa. Um, she often skewers the small-minded conformity, as she calls it, but also reveres and applauds the honest values of the common men and women in the Midwest. Glaspell was never one to force a message on her reader. Um, but even her most humorous works offer food for thought. And she always expresses a deep concern for ethical and moral issues. And really on a more personal level, she encourages self-reliance, self-confidence, and creativity. And Again, she's unique in encouraging those traits, not just for men, but for women. Glaspell was very popular during her lifetime, but she suffered the fate of many women writers of her day, falling into obscurity after her death, 
Her novels were not reprinted, and many of her best short stories were difficult to find. In recent years, though, Susan Glaspell's work has been rediscovered. It's found the attention that it so richly deserves. Um, there have been two new biographies that have been published, a new collection of her plays. I actually edited, um, just last year, a new collection of her short stories called Her America which was published by the University of Iowa Press in the summer of 2010. Um, her America includes, as I say, her best short stories, and surely one of those is A Jury of Her Peers. Um, a Jury of Her Peers is now widely regarded as a classic American short story. Um, it was included by John Updike as one of the very best short stories of the 20th century, and also chosen by Tony Hillerman as one of the best mystery stories of the century. And that's what I want to talk about this evening. Um, I was introduced to Susan Glaspell through a jury of her peers. I first read it in 1990 when I was preparing to teach a law and literature seminar, and it was listed as one of the most 10 most assigned works. Um, I was interested because the others were all well-known classics by male writers, you know, Aeschylus, Shakespeare, Melville, Camus, um, Kafka. Susan Glaspell's was the only one by a woman writer. Now, I discovered that Glaspell wrote this work first as a play, a one-act play called Trifles for the Provincetown Players in 1916. This was her first venture into playwriting, and it was a huge success. A year later, she reworked the material into this famous short story, A Jury of Her Peers. Now, I've assigned Glaspell's story to my students every year since I first read it, and they and I love the story. I strongly recommend it to you. It's very widely accessible in my collection, but also online. Um, very provocative questions for, discuss for discussion. Um, domestic abuse, justifiable homicide, um, legal versus moral responsibility, and different perceptions of men and by men and women of crime and morality. Now, I don't want to say too much about the story, but I have to say a little just before I get into the story of Margaret Hossack. Um, Jury of Her Peers is set, and this is Susan Glaspell's story, is set in the Midwest in the 1900s. And the narrative begins after a woman has been, a farm woman, has been accused of murdering her husband. He's been killed, strangled, actually, in his bed while he slept. His wife has been accused of the crime, and the male authorities have gone to the farmhouse to search for clues. Their wives are also along to put, a, to put aside a few clothes for the accused woman in jail. Um, but they, much to their own surprise, discover evidence that the woman has been accused, has been abused, the accused woman has been abused by her husband, that she led a lonely and difficult life in this isolated farmhouse, and that she killed her husband in retribution for what he did to her. Now, as the women piece together the story, it's not that they necessarily decide that she was justified in what she did. But they do feel guilty for not coming to her aid. They knew she was in trouble, and they did nothing. Um, and they also see that perhaps, John, that perhaps John Wright, her husband, bears some moral, if not legal, responsibility for what has happened. They also understand that the evidence that they've found showing motive will be used in the courtroom to convict Minnie Wright. Ultimately, acting as the jury of, the peer, of her peers in Glaspell's title, the women decide to go against their husbands, um, unusual for them, but they decide to conceal the evidence from the men. And again, not necessarily because they think she's justified, 
but they recognize that the man won't be able to empathize with the accused woman, that they won't be able to understand the experiences that she has been through, what she's endured in her life. Whatever the proper result under the law, Glasspool suggests to her readers, to her audiences in trifles, that justice would not have been done in that courtroom, again, because a jury of many rights peers would not have been judging her. Well, as a lawyer, I was interested in what had led Susan Glasspool to this conclusion. Why was it that she was so doubtful about the criminal justice system and about our ability to find the right result. So I decided to play detective. And that was the beginning of my investigation into the story of Margaret Hasek and into the book Midnight Assassin, which I wrote with my husband Tom. Um, Margaret Hasek was the real Iowa farm wife who in 1900 was accused of killing her husband. She didn't do it with a rope. Um, Susan Glasspool left out the more gory details. Um, Margaret Hasek did it with an ax, if she did it. I should say John Hasek was murdered with an ax. He was hit twice in the head, once with the sharp end and once with the blunt end. Um, he was killed obviously, um, and Margaret Hasek was accused of the crime. Now, Susan Glasspool had observed and covered this story while she was a very young reporter for the Des Moines Daily News, and the story had a profound effect on Glasspool. It stayed with her for 15 years until she fictionalized it first as trifles and then as a jury of her peers. What I didn't know when I started researching the story was that Margaret Hasek, the story of Margaret Hasek, which is filled with violence, with family conflicts, and mystery, would have such a powerful effect on me as well, and that I would continue to investigate and write about this case for more than a decade. So let me back up and tell you a little bit about Susan Glasspool. Um, Susan Glasspool was, and here she is as an older woman, um, when she, after she had written so many of her famous works. Um, but Susan Glasspool was born in Davenport. Um, she was the great granddaughter of one of the Iowa pioneers, an early settler there, who had established a fruit farm. But the farm was not successful, the Glasspool fortunes declined, and by the time of Susan's birth, the family had been forced to move into town, which was where Susan grew up in a house high on the bluffs overlooking the Mississippi River. Now Susan had two brothers. But she was clearly the most gifted and ambitious of the three. Neither of the boys finished high school. They both got jobs at the Rock Island Arsenal, while Susan excelled, choosing the most rigorous courses in Latin and literature and graduating at the very top of her class of 53 students. Susan dreamed of going to college. It wasn't the typical route for women at her time. Only 2% of college students um, were female at this time. Um, and I will say, Susan's father did not approve of Susan taking this step. And as he said, he was either unable or probably more likely unwilling to pay. But Susan was, as I say, very ambitious, and she was determined to go to college. Um, she decided to work to earn the money to pay for it herself. She was already interested in writing. She had contributed a few articles to the Davenport Morning Republican while she was in school. She got a job there after high school. Initially, of course, she was hired to type and proofread, but she worked herself up and in a year was promoted to society editor. Now her job was to report on the social doings of the wealthy class, which really didn't sit well 
with her. She believed in equality and women's rights, but she did get in some snide comments, somewhat sarcastic, about the superficiality and the silly customs of the people she was observing, and she included some very serious suggestions about education, women's rights, and prison reform. Now, after two years, of working, Susan was finally able to realize her dream. Iowa City would have been much closer, less expensive than um, Des Moines, but Susan Glasbow welcomed the distance from her family. It was 100 miles away. And I will say Drake also appealed to her for other reasons. As the founders had proclaimed in 1888, the university was, de was designed on what they said a broad, liberal, and modern basis. And it pledged to be open to all, regardless of race, color, or creed. Glasbow surely considered herself a modern modern woman, a new woman, and she was opposed to the notion that those of her sex should be confined to marriage, to living at home, so she was certainly attracted by the school's progressive goals and by the excellent faculty. And Drake was quick to recognize Susan Glasspool's extraordinary intelligence. In fact, they gave her two years of credit, college credit, for the accelerated courses she had taken at Davenport High School. So in the fall of, 18, of 1897, at the age of 21, Susan Glaspell enrolled at Drake as a junior. Um, there weren't any residence halls for the students yet. She ensconced herself in a rooming house on 28th Street. She was outspoken, vivacious. She quickly made friends with the other students. She joined the Margaret Fuller Society. Um, she studied hard, taking courses in philosophy, Greek, French, literature, and she also devoted herself to writing. Several of her articles were published in the Delphic um, and to oratory. She became vice president of the Debate Society, and she traveled all over the state to compete in competitions. Susan graduated in 1899 with a degree in philosophy. She was one of three students chosen to speak at an official banquet, and the Des Moines Daily News announced that Susie Glaspell, as she was known, um, had plan planned to pursue her studies in literature at the University of Chicago. Once again, though, Susan Glaspell needed to make money to pay for her schooling. So she accepted a job with the Des Moines Daily News. Um, she was ignorant of state politics, and so she was somewhat displeased to find that she was assigned to the State House beat. But she did it, and at the same time, she persuaded her editors to allow her to write um, a more freewheeling comment on a column on current events. She called it News Girl. She impressed the editors with her work ethic, her intelligence, her excellent writing skills, and it wasn't long before they gave her a higher profile job. Um, in 1900, Susan Glaspell was sent to downstate, to Indianola, to cover the murder of John Hossack, a 59-year-old respected farmer, a member of his community who had been violently killed with an ax while he slept in his bed. Now, the assignment was very unusual for a woman. In fact, Susie Glaspell um, was the only woman assigned out of the many reporters who swarmed into Indianola to cover this trial. Um, but her editors trusted Glaspell. Um, they wanted, they knew this was going to be a high profile case covered by media. They wanted someone who could write sensationalistic prose, who could hook her readers, keep it on the front page, and Susan Glaspell did not disappoint. She wrote more than 24 articles on the Hasek case covering the murder, the investigation, and the trial, and it was a story that stayed with her for years. In her memoir that she wrote many years later when she talked about writing trifles, she wrote, 
When I was a newspaper reporter out in Iowa, I was sent downstate to do a murder trial, and I never forgot going into the kitchen of a woman locked up in town. Now that sentence, by the way, was my first clue that Susan Glaspell was actually inspired by fact to write these two classic works of fiction. So I was able to identify the Hasek case um, by looking at newspaper reports on microfilm. Um, the Hasek case seemed the one. It was the right time frame. It was a wife accused of killing her husband in bed. Um, again, with an ax, not with a rope. But I eventually found, and this gave me great confidence that I had found the right one, a list of the reporters who covered the Hasse case, and Susie Glaspell, Susie Keating Glaspell, was listed as one of them. So I felt that I had found gold. Um, I read hundreds of articles on microfilms. I went to courthouses, um, eventually with the help of Tom. Um, I found the original transcripts of the, of the coroner's inquest, the grand jury hearings. Um, I wrote a law review article on the topic, on the subject of Glaspell and of Margaret Hasek. But as Tom said, in a law review article, all of the good stuff is hidden down in the footnotes. Um, so he convinced me that he would work with me on a book which we wanted to read like a novel, although we were also determined to keep it as true to the facts as we could. And I will say everything that's in quotes in the book comes from transcripts. It is literary nonfiction. Um, it is, again, as true to the facts as we can make it. Now, Eventually, we expanded our search. Um, we talked to descendants of the Hasek family, all of whom I should say were very cooperative with our search. We went to Indianola, visited the farmhouse. We saw the graves of Margaret and John Hasek. Um, we talked to a lot of community members in Indianola to find out what they had learned through the generations. We even went to Anamosa State Penitentiary, where Margaret Hasek had been imprisoned for a year, to try to find out what had happened in this story. Now, to tell you a little bit about it, the murder of John Hasek, as I said, occurred, well, was very violent, occurred the night of December 1st, 1900. And his wife of 33 years, they had been living a long, together a long time, Margaret cl claimed, to be sleeping, claimed to be sleeping next to him during the attack. Um, she said she slept through it, woke up only when she heard a noise. When she heard the noise, she said, she called up to her children. They had nine children. Five of them were in this small house at the time of the attack. The children came down to meet Margaret, and they went into the bedroom together where they found John Hasek fatally wounded. He was not dead yet, and the children were dispatched to run to the neighbor's house to get neighbors to come. Um, a, a doctor, um, there were no telephones, but a horseman went to get a doctor. There were a few telephones, but none that could be used. A doctor came, although he didn't come until 4 a.m., so there wasn't much he could do at that point if he could have done anything earlier, it's doubtful. Um, observers testified that Margaret Hasek sat by her husband during his these hours before his death, holding his hand, giving him water, and crying. Eventually, John Hasek died at about 10 a.m. On, on Sunday morning. Now, the, the investigators, the male investigators, arrived the next day. Um, and very quickly, George Clammer, who was a young county attorney, very ambitious. This was his first murder case. He was determined to get a conviction in this murder case. And he focused on Margaret Hasek right away as the primary suspect. He did not believe her story that she could have slept through this attack. Um, they had been sleeping in a very small bed. It wasn't a king size bed or a double or a full size or a queen size bed or even a full size bed. It was what they called a three quarters bed. And these people were very large. Um, they were sleeping very close together. And in George Clammer's mind, 
the idea came to him, well, how could she not have been touched by the ax if he reached over her to strike John Hasek? There was no evidence of an intruder. Nothing had been stolen. Um, and the next morning, the investigators found the family ax, which was covered with blood and hairs, never clearly established if they were human or animal, hairs or blood, but that was said to be the, the murder weapon, um, which seemed to clamor at least to point even more definitively to Margaret Hasek. Now, what really convinced clamor, however, was the testimony of the neighbors at the coroner's inquest the next day. The neighbors were very reluctant to talk at first, but they eventually admitted that they had known for years that there had been trouble between the Hasek couple. Um, even as these people were saying John Hasek was one of the most well-respected men in the community, he was God-fearing, he paid his debts on time, he didn't drink, they were also telling a different story, one that they had known for years but had covered up because they thought it was a secret because of the good standing of the family. It seems that John Hasek was an angry and a moody man who suffered from possibly mental illness, certainly the neighbors called them tantrums. Um, neighbors knew that Margaret Hasek had come to them often in tears for more than 15 years, asking for pleading, really, for help, saying that she feared that she or her children would be hurt by her husband. He threatened them with guns, with knives. She was also terrified that her husband would find out about these conversations. She implored her neighbors not to disclose them to her husband, um, and often in tears, she told her neighbors that it would be a blessing if John Hasek died. Now, the neighbors told her there was nothing they could do. Family matters, they said, were family matters. They were private. In fact, they advised Margaret Hasek over and over not to interfere with their lives, with her troubles. She should keep her family matters to herself. One year before the murder, there was an especially threatening confrontation between Margaret and John. Margaret ran to a neighbor's house in the rain. Um, she told the neighbor, one of the men who had been involved um, in the past, that she had to separate from John Hasek, that she wanted a division of the property. But of course, the property was all in John's name. She had no source of income. There was nothing that she could do. The neighbor men decided the best thing for her was to go home. They took her back home. They said, you must reconcile with your husband. Um, although they also met among themselves, they admitted later, and discussed the possibility that maybe John Hasek should be committed to an insane asylum, maybe he should be arrested. But of course, John Hasek was a very good friend of, his, of theirs. He was respected in the community. Those options seemed impossible for them to carry out. So they gathered the family, the mother and the children, and they issued a stern warning to them. They must never talk again about their family troubles. They must never come to the neighbors um, to ask them for help. They should keep them to themselves. It was one year later that John Hasek was found murdered in his bed. Was the reconciliation successful? It's impossible to know. The couple had entertained people for Thanksgiving just a few days before. The children had said it had been a peaceful party. But who knows what the relationship was between the couple. You know, it's interesting because two, year, two days after her husband's death, Margaret Hasek was questioned by the inquest jury about her marriage. And when it was her turn to speak, she would not admit that she had ever been threatened by her husband. She denied that they had had trouble um, or that she had been afraid of him. Now, she must have known that the neighbors would report what they had heard to the inquest jury. Um, but the worst she would say of him was that sometimes he was out of humor, 
um, he could be difficult to please. Now, the men on the inquest jury were incredulous as they heard Margaret Hasek say this. And in fact, they reminded her several times that she was under oath. I think, I believe the words they said were, John Hasek listens to every word you say. Now, why they thought that would encourage her to say more about how awful John Hasek was, I'm not sure. Um, but Margaret Hasek was consistent in the story that she told. And as she stood up to leave, she said to these men, all friends of her husband, she said, well, I gentlemen, I hope you don't think I killed him. I wouldn't do any such thing. I loved him too much. So why didn't she tell about the story of her marriage? You know, I think that it really says something about or goes to something that we see in domestic abuse today, kind of the norm of family privacy, that it's embarrassing to admit that a woman for a woman or a victim of any type has been abused. Maybe she knew that the abuse would be used to blame her for what had happened. Um, or that the abuse would be used to show that she had a motive. She had sought to escape from her husband. Was there anyone who had more of a motive to want John Hasek dead? So Margaret Hasek never changed her story, and her children supported her throughout her ordeal. Um, but she was taken into custody. In fact, she was arrested as she left the cemetery after burying her husband. She was surrounded by her nine children and two sons-in-law and her brother. And the sheriff arrived um, and took her to the county jail where she was charged with first-degree murder. Now, soon after, um, Margaret Hasek was arrested. The Hasek family hired William Berry, a very passionate and well-respected lawyer, to defend her. Um, he felt that he had a good defense. No woman had ever been tried or convicted in Warren County for a murder. And there were still deeply ingrained expectations at that time about how a woman should act. Um, his idea was that potential jurors who were all men, women could not live, could not serve on juries at the time, um, that these potential jurors who lived with women, their wives and their daughters, would be reluctant to believe that a woman could be capable of murder, especially if she could be made to look like the women they lived with, a normal woman. So that was a strategy, by the way, that had worked with Lizzie Borden. You all may have heard of Lizzie Borden. She took an ax and gave her father 40 wax. Well, she, Lizzie Borden, there was complete overwhelming evidence that she had committed the ax murder of her Fa father and her stepmother. Um, but Lizzie Borden wore lace, became hysterical, cried, was very feminine in the courtroom, and her lawyers played that up. You know, it is morally impossible for a woman to commit murder, he said. And the jurors took only 90 minutes to examine these boxes and boxes of evidence produced by the prosecution, and they acquitted her. There were no other suspects. Lizzie Borden inherited the money that she had fought about with her father, lived very well, high on the hill, and no one was ever charged for the murder of her father. But would the same strategy work for Margaret Hasek? That was the question. Um, Barry wasn't helped by the characterizations of Margaret Hasek. You know, the reporters commented on the few tears she shed, um, at least in public, after her husband's death. Her face was de defined as hard and stern and unfeeling. Whether or not she killed her husband, she was at least guilty of not properly mourning his death. She was also always, or almost always, defined in very masculine terms. Um, you know, she wasn't that unusual for a farm woman. She was strong and sturdy and hardened by outside work. Um, but they mentioned her cold, steely eyes, the fact that she looked like she would be dangerous if she was aroused, as one said. Um, 
You know, Susan Glaspell even said, well, she's tall and powerful. She's the one who said, a woman who looks like she would be dangerous if she was aroused to a point of hatred. What's interesting, though, about Susan Glaspell is that she seemed really to go through a transformation during this period of observing Margaret Hasek. And I think this was a transformative experience for Susan Glaspell. Um, we know that Susan Glaspell visited the farmhouse of Margaret Hasek. And we believe that standing in that farmhouse and getting a sense of the oppressed and difficult and backbreaking life that Margaret Hasek, a woman who had very few options and very few, very little enjoyment in her life, for Susan Glaspell to get a, a sense of that experience and then to compare that experience with herself. I mean, here she was, a 26-year-old, educated college graduate. She had friends. She lived in a city. She dreamed of being a famous writer. And she really, although she was aware of the women's rights movement, she hadn't really thought much about the oppression of women. She didn't feel oppressed. And I think until she saw how Margaret Hasek lived and what her options were, she hadn't understood the kinds of conditions women, especially farm women, in rural areas um, experienced. Now, the work that Margaret Hasek did, I should say, was made even worse or more difficult by the fact that she, that she had 10 pregnancies, 10 pregnancies. The last, she had her last child when she was age 44. All of her children were born at home, and really she risked her life with each one of those. In April 1901, Margaret Hasek was tried for first-degree murder in the Warren County Courthouse. Um, the prosecutor asked that she be sentenced to death for her crime. The trial generated enormous publicity. Crowds lined up and filled the courtroom. Standing room was filled. Um, the seats were filled, standing room only, and that space was filled. Um, the prosecution presented evidence to support its charges, the family acts, the difficulty in believing her story, but most significantly, the evidence of motive that was proved through the stories that her husband had abused her. And it quickly became clear, and I think this is something that affected Susan Glaspell very profoundly also, that Margaret Hasek's character and her behavior as a woman were also at issue. You know, the prosecution argued what kind of a woman could commit the unthinkable crime of killing her husband? Um, so they argued that a woman, she said she slept through the attack and yet she had had children. What kind of a woman could have, a, a mother, could have slept through that kind of noise and not woken up? You know, it's like she's guilty if she didn't wake up because she's a bad mother, she's guilty if she did wake up because she's lying to us. Guilty, guilty, either way. Um, they made the point that she testified that when she heard the noise, she ran upstairs to get her children. As the prosecutor said, what kind of a woman wouldn't go to her husband first for help? What kind of a woman would leave the bedroom and go up to find her children? Um, the defense lawyers were in kind of a bind. You know, they couldn't claim that the, the abuse was a mitigating factor because Margaret Hasek said she was innocent. So they talked about the trials and the burdens borne by Margaret Hasek during her trial, um, and they stressed that during the last year, she had apparently reconciled with her husband. She had pledged to the neighbors that she would stay with him and that she would be an obedient and subservient wife. Susan Glaspell was in the courtroom for much of the trial. And of course, she was watching a process that was controlled by men. All of the lawyers were men. Um, the judge was a man. All of the jury members were men. Um, 
And by the end of the trial, Susan Glaspell really was on the side of the defendant. She told her readers she thought Margaret Hasek was telling the truth, and she told her readers that she believed the women in the courtroom, and they made up a majority of the observers, even though they didn't participate, that they felt Margaret Hasek deserved an acquittal because she had suffered so much in her marriage. In the end, though, the 12 men were not so convinced um, Margaret Hasek was found guilty of murder in the first degree, um, although the jury at least recommended against execution. Now the judge sentenced her to life in prison. She was sent to Anamosa Penitentiary. The legal verdict wasn't the end of the story. She eventually, and we talk about this in the book, she was retried. Um, Iowa Supreme Court reversed the conviction on a minor error. She was retried in Winterset, hung jury. She was released. She was sent, she went back home to Indianola. And in a somewhat ironic twist, she was buried right next to her husband in the New Virginia Cemetery. Now, the Hasek story ended for Susan Glaspell when the jury in the first trial declared Ma Margaret Hasek guilty. Um, she quit her job with the newspaper and she moved home saying she wanted to devote herself to fiction in Davenport and she was very successful. Published three novels. Um, she stayed in Davenport for 10 years until she fell in love with Jig Cook who was a dedicated socialist and free, um, well what should I say, free thinker who was engaged to be married to another woman. Susan moved to New York associated with a bohemian group. Um, Jig Cook eventually married her there, joined her there, they were married. Unusually for the time, Susan Glaspell did not change her surname to that of her husband's. Fifteen years later, Susan Glaspell wrote about the Margaret Hasek trial in a jury of her peers, trifles first and then a jury of her peers. Um, it didn't surface until she had started the Provincetown Players with Jig Cook and they were operating out of the Wharf Theater in Provincetown. Susan talks about going to the theater to try to think what kind of play to write, um, sitting, hearing the waves under her feet, and suddenly having this vision of being in that kitchen um, where the woman who was accused had spent so much of her time but was not there now, and the scene just came back to her. Um, she wrote it very quickly. She adapted it then to a jury of her peers. Here is the first production of Trifles, which was a great success. Um, then she adapted it for Jury of Her Peers, which was also acclaimed um, as a terrific, a great American story. Um, neither is a literal retelling of the Hasek case. I mean, details are clearly different. And Susan Glaspell didn't focus in the story or on the play on who done it. You know, if you've read either of them, you get a sense that Minnie Wright did kill her husband, and you know why. Susan Glaspell didn't know whether Margaret Hasek killed her husband or not, and believe me, Tom and I have done enough research so that we don't know either, although we have our guesses. But what Susan Glaspell wanted to focus on was what was missing from the courtroom. The moral questions that were ignored, um, the voices of the women, the women were really silenced. They were not the ones who judged Margaret Hasek. And Susan Glaspell focused on the empathic understanding that the women had for Minnie Wright that seemed to be absent from the courtroom. Um, our story of Susan Glaspell ends in 1917, but she lived more than 30 years after that until 1948. She didn't have a happy life. Um, Jig Cook died in 1924. Um, Susan Glaspell was devastated by his death. She was uprooted from her friends. She became more isolated. Um, but she found solace in her writing. In 1931, she won the Pulitzer Prize for Allison's House. She died of pneumonia in 1948 at the age of 72. And just two things in closing. Let me say, Susan Glaspell didn't focus on the question of who done it, but Tom and I could not ignore that question when we were writing our book. Um, 
But as you know if you've read the book, or when you do read the book, we don't announce a definitive conclusion. Really, we've told everything that we found, and we looked for years and years, and we've tried to stay as true to the facts as we possibly could. Um, and I do believe that any reader who picks up the book will reach their own conclusion about who killed John Hasek and why. Ultimately, we decided, just as Susan Glaspell did, that the story is not about a whodunit. It's really about how a crime affected a community, how we see justice, um, how stories are told in the courtroom, how the media reports on these events, how family emotions and loyalties play out. Um, impossible, often, for outsiders ever to comprehend. You know, as I'm here at Drake, I imagine the formative years that Susan Glaspell spent on this campus, developing her intellect and honing her writing skills, that she was able so powerfully to transform fact into fiction, conveying her concerns and her insights so that they would last through the generations. Our book, Midnight Assassin, is certainly the story of a trial and a murder. But I think it's also the story of Susan Glaspell's unique creativity and remarkable skill of how this great American author came to write trifles and a jury of her peers, two rich and classic works that will live on for generations to come. Thank you.